Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, Juniper webinar. My name is uh, Thierry Richet from uh, Service Provider Marketing of Juniper. Today our uh, session is about SD1 and uh, more precisely showing how SD1 should be considered as a little bit more than uh, just a connectivity problem. We have uh, two speakers with us today, Mr. Michael Mill, Senior Manager IC EMEA from Juniper Networks, and uh, Mr. Karsten Rosenhovel, Managing Director of the European Advanced Networking Test Center in Germany, uh, that uh, recently conducted a series of tests on the Juniper SD1 solution, and is going to tell us about uh, those tests. During uh, this webinar, you'll have possibility to ask questions via the uh, box uh, located uh, at the bottom left of your screen normally, uh, and we will probably take two or three questions at the end of the, of the presentation. Without waiting any further, let's start the session. Uh, Michael, um, I now give you this uh, virtual microphone and floor. Okay, uh, thank you Thierry, and uh, good morning uh, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us in this uh, webinar. So this webinar is about uh, enterprises and how enterprises are looking to transform their branch network infrastructure uh, to be more agile, more flexible, and centrally uh, controlled. But why is that? So before giving the mic uh, to Karsten uh, from EANTC, uh, who kindly accepted to run uh, this webinar with Juniper, I wanted to start by sharing uh, a piece of thought with you. So yes, SD1 has become a reality, and there is definitely a need and an opportunity here. But there is also a, a lot of confusion. The fuzzy nature of the SD1 definition and the hype uh, behind it lead to a situation where every age-related company wants to become an SD1 company. But what are we uh, really uh, talking about? Are we talking about an OTT product? Are we talking about a new set of features? Do it yourself or manage service? A product or a service, actually? And also, uh, are we talking about cloud-based or deployment on-premise? All of these, you know, are very uh, different in nature. And what seems to be wise is probably to step back a little bit, look at the actual uh, needs and facts, not necessarily by reinventing the wheel, and then come with a solution, but not the other way around. So to really understand the rise of SD1, we should look at the overall market dynamics here. Everything started with a digital transformation, and if you remember well, not so long ago, we were talking about SDN and how it applied to virtual CPE, NFV, and cloud. Some customers did implement it for a while, like cloud providers or telco, and some others did not start their journey yet. But at the same time, you know, the digital uh, transformation is amplifying uh, itself. First, with the multi-cloud and bring your own device phenomenon, we are increasing the number of endpoints and type of endpoints to interconnect. Then all the connected services are then de facto under pressure with high expectation in terms of fast deployment, flexibility on topologies, with no possible trade-off on high availability. Cost also becomes uh, an important driver, and companies are looking at internet as a cheaper media, but they are also looking at more flexible business models, such as pay-as-you-grow or pay-as-you-use. Also, because more and more business become digitalized, Application-based SLAs, deep monitoring and visibility from the end user are becoming key characteristics to make sure the end-to-end -end experience is good. And finally, last but not least, uh, as a consequence, security uh, does matter more than ever, since most uh, business workloads become widely distributed with local breakouts spreading across multiple environments forcing security to be deployed in a pervasive manner. 
So that is the result of all these dynamics put together, which creates the SD1 uh, phenomenon. So how did uh, Juniper approach SD1? Well, first, we made uh, the deliberate choice to grow the solution organically. We have no third-party acquisition or integration dependency, and you should look at it really not as a standalone product, but rather as a feature solution which spans across our entire portfolio. So whether if we talk about SRX, VSRX, or NFX as endpoints, or MX, SRX, and VSRX as hubs or gateways, of course, we also have developed an additional piece of software called the Control Service Orchestration, which acts as the orchestrator and management piece of the solution. For that, we are capitalizing on 20 plus years of experience in routing and security, together now with the SDN market leadership with Control. But where did we put the focus on to differentiate? Well, number one uh, is the openness of the solution. So open APIs are available on CSO, and we are only using standard protocols, such as GRE and IPsec for the overlay. We also uh, do support third-party VNF uh, on our uh, universal CPEs. And there is also a way on uh, the CSO uh, product to build what we call uh, custom templates so that a new capability can be added very quickly. And Karsten uh, will actually further elaborate on that. Number two is making it carrier grade to highly uh, perform and scale. So it can uh, sound obvious, but no trade-offs will be accepted here. In particular, multi-tenancy and fine-grained uh, role-based access control have proven uh, to be key to service providers and large customers. Number three is uh, making it easy to integrate uh, in brownfield scenarios, uh, which can sound obvious as well, but not uh, as easy to, to implement. And number four is about offering uh, native security capabilities, but also leave the door open to third-party security as an option. So uh, very quickly, uh, how uh, does uh, Control SD1 uh, look like? It is actually very simple. Uh, if you look at the diagram uh, displayed here, you can see the three main layers of the solution. The first one uh, on the top is Control uh, Service Orchestration, which serves as the SD1 uh, GUI, uh, but also control and management piece, as well as the VNF Orchestrator for uh, universal CPEs. The second layer is the CPE layer, and here the beauty is that you can mix and match regular branch CPEs like SRX with, with universal CPEs like NFX. And we are also working uh, on a pure software model as well so that you could deploy off-the-shelf white boxes uh, on top of the existing Juniper uh, appliances. Finally, the third layer is the one of the hub and gateway. And here you can also mix and match uh, you know, well-known devices, uh, such as MX and SRX, uh, to act as uh, physical hubs on gateway, as well as virtual SRX for virtual hub on gateways uh, in the cloud. So then you might ask me, uh, are we stopping here? So definitely uh, the answer is no. And again, uh, mainly driven but by what we are uh, uh, seeing coming from the market. We are now at a point where you can already deploy SD1 and distributed NSV uh, with security all together at the same time in an integrated uh, fashion thanks to CSO. But what we do see coming next uh, is an extension to what we start calling uh, SD branch, so software defined branch which will be a superset of SD1 breaking into the LAN. So by breaking into the LAN, we mean that there will be ways to merge uh, ZTP and management workflows coming both from the one, but also the LAN together, but also leverage uh, deep analytics from both sides 
to extend the SLA performance analysis to the LAN, including uh, some Wi-Fi uh, aspects. So uh, let me stop here uh, now, and I will be uh, happy to come back uh, at the end of the webinar uh, for the Q&A session. Thank you, Miguel. Um, I remind everyone you have a possibility to ask questions via the, the box at the uh, bottom left of your screen. Uh, and again, we will take uh, two or three of them, uh, the most representative at the end uh, of, the, of the presentation. Let's now talk about uh, the test uh, actually conducted by the uh, European Advanced Networking uh, Test Center. Uh, Kirsten, if you can hear me, uh, can you tell us more about those tests and results? Uh, and I, I give you the control if you, if you can. Thank you, Thierry. Of course, it uh, would be a pleasure. So um, ENTC is an independent test lab uh, based in Berlin in Germany. We've been around for more than 20 years now. And uh, we are currently running for almost two years already an SD-WAN testing program. So Juniper commissioned us to conduct an independent test of the uh, Contrail SD-WAN solution. And um, we created a test plan together with Juniper that's uh, individual but still independent and um, as vendor neutral as possible. So uh, from ENTC's uh, core competency areas, we have always been testing with uh, network equipment manufacturers, but uh, the, the, our main customer base is actually uh, service providers, communication service providers, large enterprises and uh, government authorities, where we run uh, POC tests, acceptance tests and audits. And uh, for the SD-WAN program specifically, we've taken a lot of input from service providers um, where we usually get to the scene to, to talk about, to, to test the um, actual uh, deployment scenarios, the requirements, uh, which are very individual and diverse at this point. So in the SD-WAN market, we also see very diverse solutions, as uh, Michael has explained. And um, we are we're actually uh, tailoring the test plans to each of these vendor solutions so that we understand like uh, which are the key highlights and areas to uh, test. So um, ENTC is not only uh, active in SD-WAN, we're also um, doing uh, 5G testing quite a lot now. We are part of uh, research programs and uh, industry projects uh, testing 5G. We're doing MPLS and SDN interoperability um, for many years. We're testing NFV and SDN in general, and we're also doing uh, next-gen firewall testing. So before I get to the details of the test, um, how has the SD-WAN uh, market developed? And uh, Michael has already explained there are a couple of stages. What we see at, from ENTC's point of view at this time is that the market is just unfolding. I mean, from the vendor, vendor side, there are more than, I think we counted 60 vendors out there who claim to have products. So maybe, you know, the, the number of vendors who really sell uh, ready products is lower, but still there it's a it's a wide variety. There are very different types of vendors. Um, some coming from the routing space, some coming from the WAN optimization space, some coming from the firewall space, or um, other types of solutions. And um, the service providers have started uh, deploying production services a short while back. Enterprises are just getting into this and the market will grow substantially in the next five years. So um, this is a slide from IHS market from an analyst and um, they are projecting that the market will grow to a factor of like more than 300% in the next four years and um, especially uh, from, from 2018 to 2019 the growth is expected to be 76%. So we do see a lot of solutions um, developing. We see very active um, development from our vendor customers and it's always interesting to be able to independently analyze um, how the solutions actually work. So I'm, I'm happy that Juniper has commissioned us to run this test now. So um, we went to the Juniper headquarter in Sunnyvale, California in September to carry out the tests and uh, we found a test scenario with a different, you know, a range of different 
CPEs and hub devices. So on the hub side, we tested the physical SRX 4100 in the um, active-passive com uh, combination uh, setup. And uh, on the uh, CPE side, we tested NFX 250s, in, uh, sometimes in uh, dual homing scenarios, sometimes in uh, single homing uh, multi-site scenarios. And uh, there were, was also a physical SRX 340 included in the test on the CPE side. Now, the NFXs are so-called universal CPEs, so they're first and foremost uh, routers, and they do have the ability to run additional workloads because they are, there is an x86 uh, service included, and uh, inside this NFX 250, there was the uh, virtual SRX implementation, the vSRX from Juniper running. Uh, all of the solutions used software version 15, which is the latest one uh, that was available at the time of the test. And um, as uh, Michael has already explained, the most important piece of this all is sitting on top in the center, it's the CSO, the Contrail uh, Services Orchestrator, which uh, manages all of the different assets um, from the SD-WAN endpoints and also is the central configuration entity. Now, uh, to set up some realistic network in the lab, uh, we constructed two emulated wide area networks. The red cloud in the bottom is the internet, and the blue cloud in the top is an MPLS wide area network. Uh, in the end, these were just, you know, some switches in the lab. But it's important to, of course, be able to uh, test this dual uh, uplink connectivity for each of the SD-WAN endpoints. And in one of these links, we actually included an impairment generator, as you can see in the bottom center, this kind of uh, funny monitor with like a graph on it. Uh, that's an impairment generator, and uh, I'll explain later what it can do exactly. But basically, it's um, the impairment generator emulates suboptimal, like Im imperfect wide area network quality. So um, I'm going to introduce five of the tests to you and of course you know we spend like two weeks in Juniper's lab uh, there is there is way more content and we will only be able to touch upon the most important aspects during this hour of the webinar uh, there is much more documentation available publicly um, which I will point you to at the end uh, we've published a detailed report so let me start with the scalability test so uh, scalability is an is an interesting challenge because it's very different per service provider. In preparation of this test, we inquired with a couple of tier ones, um, like what are the scalability requirements? And some of them said like, yes, we have a few very large tenants. And others said, no, we actually have a very large number of small tenants. And yet others said, well, most of our uh, enterprise customers connect to the cloud. So uh, there is no single blueprint test configuration that will work for everyone. Uh, Juniper decided to go with one, uh, with one uh, specific configuration, um, with testing more than 10,000 emulated CPEs to be connected to the Contrail Services Orchestrator. Now, the focus of this test was really on the Services Orchestrator, not so much on the CPE at all, because they were all uh, emulated, and uh, the CPEs were emulated by Juniper's in-house software which uh, just provided the management uplink. Uh, we did not set up all of these uh, hundreds of thousands of tunnels between the emulated CBEs, and they, wanted, they were not actually running traffic. We just wanted to see if uh, the services orchestrator would scale to this huge number of CPEs. So um, because the activation took some time, uh, Juniper already presented to us a configuration that had 9,780 spoke sites already activated. And then our team was allowed to activate 241 additional ones with zero touch provisioning. So basically we ran through the steps in CSO to create the sites and then to configure them and just to hit activate for all of them in a bulk action. And um, the, then finally 9,780 plus uh, 241 yielded a total of 10,021 provisioned CPEs. So the test was successful and um, the system was stable. So we were able to monitor that uh, Contrail Services Orchestrator could still easily be configured. It didn't slow down, uh, it didn't crash, it, it behaved just as expected. 
So uh, this scalability test really focused on the orchestration side of the testing, uh, which is often overlooked because a lot of the challenge of managing SD-WAN is really on the orchestration uh, scale, performance, availability, and other aspects. So next, uh, we looked at zero-touch provisioning, and uh, I think I saw this in uh, Michael's introduction as well. ZTP, zero-touch provisioning, is very important to reduce the, deep, uh, the, the provisioning time uh, that an enterprise uh, witnesses. So of course, the goal is to reduce the effort and the calendar time it takes to provision each CPE site. Now, I think vendors have made good progress in deploying very simple-minded single CPE single homed sites, but for some of the more challenging, uh, more advanced enterprise customers, it's always a question, what happens if you actually have a more complex scenario? And um, so German, Juniper wanted to show that uh, they can also provision more complex CPE site scenarios in, an, uh, in a zero touch provisioning manner. So in this case, we had an NFX 250 cluster. We took the two devices that we had available in the lab. We actually configured them as a dual CPE scenario and an active-active cluster, where both of these are supposed to be used in a load balancing way. And um, on the hub side, we connected them to a multi-homing scenario with the SRX 4100s at the hub at the top of this diagram, which are working in act active passive mode. So only one of them is forwarding traffic at one time. Um, we started with these uh, with a factory default configuration, so basically in an unboxing, like an unboxing scenario. Um, then it's necessary to uh, configure, uh, put in the serial number into a um, configuration. And um, once the NFX250 is then connected to the internet, it will uh, actually um, directly and without further ado contact a so-called phone home server. So Juniper provides a uh, worldwide available unique service that's just, you know, one server or, you know, one server infrastructure. And um, this one, this server actually maintains configurations if they are provided by the service providers um, of each of the serial numbers and their association with specific tenants and specific configurations. So this default target is always contacted by all of the NFXs or virtual SRX implementations, actually, which are inside the NFX, um, to understand what configurations should they download. And uh, this is, of course, very neat because the only thing that a customer has to do is unpack the device and, um, you know, write down the serial number, and then it'll it'll all work magically. Um, what we found out was that uh, both of the NFXs contacted the phone home server successfully. They got their configuration, and um, they also got this active-active configuration, which is not the factory default. So we were able to see that they um, didn't just happen to work out of the box, but they actually uh, configured themselves as expected in this active-active cluster in a dual CPE scenario. So um, we use this phone home server as the first alternative. Uh, there is a second alternative uh, in case there is no internet connectivity available to the NFX, which is using a REST API as well. So the next test scenario actually looked at the traffic steering. Of course, uh, a lot of enterprises are really aiming to load balance traffic and to use their the more reliable but more expensive link service like MPLS, for example, only for uh, important applications. So it's important, it's, it's viable, it, it's, it's very important that the um, CPE can actually detect the applications. And at ENTC, we've tested a couple of SD-WAN solutions, and we're always surprised how different vendors understand this application uh, analysis. So some vendors are actually happy if they see that there is HTTP going. So they basically look at the TCP port in the IP address, in the IP packet header. But of course, almost everything in this world is HTTP, and also a lot of applications are um, encrypted. So it's um, it's not life is not that easy anymore, and a more advanced application detection algorithm is required. Now here, Juniper actually, I think, benefits from the heritage of the SRX implementation as a firewall. So uh, it was 
able to easily implement the advanced policy-based routing and to discover two you know, more difficult applications to identify. So we actually send YouTube traffic and BitTorrent. So YouTube is, of course, HTTP-based, but it's important to analyze the, the URLs, to analyze uh, the content of the HTTP packets to do some uh, deep packet inspection. And BitTorrent is also difficult to analyze because it cannot just simply be done by looking at the IP addresses. Uh, BitTorrent is a more complex protocol uh, with a lot of different connections made, so it's quite challenging to analyze it, and that's why we chose this. Now, we said, uh, let's assume the tenant at the, at the edge site is sending traffic for these two applications. We have two links, and um, we want to reroute the traffic, if needed, for uh, certain thresholds. So, actually, um, we said uh, let's have a latency threshold of 250 millisecond end-to-end -end latency for YouTube. So in case that's exceeded, then uh, this application would be failed over to the uh, backup link. And uh, for BitTorrent, we configured 300 milliseconds. So there was no loss threshold. There was a latency threshold, which I think is more realistic, actually, than a loss threshold. Um, what happened? So once we actually um, artificially impaired the, the uplinks, so, so like we increased the latency by, with this impairment generator, the applications were indeed steered to the backup link, and uh, they, they followed these constraints. And uh, so we monitored that we increased the latency to 251 milliseconds in, in the lab, and then we saw that YouTube traffic failed over, but BitTorrent still stayed on the same link as original. And when we increased the in impaired latency to more than 300 milliseconds, uh, also BitTorrent failed over. Now, this is a good result, but what we always do at NTC is we always also look at the, uh, uh, how the applications actually revert. Because if they don't revert, then a service provider would quickly end up with a network which is totally imbalanced. And um, so we switched off the impairment. We basically created the situation which was back to normal in the network. And uh, we monitored that the applications were actually really going back to their original link. And um, so that the SLAs were monitored as before and the rules were applied again in the normal case. So this actually uh, application-based traffic steering worked well. Uh, there are, uh, you know, there's much more to it, to the advanced policy-based routing than uh, what I can explain by now. We actually combine some constraints, but they can be mixed and matched in different ways. So uh, of course, one could say like this application should prefer internet, that application should prefer MPLS link. Um, you can have like a link metric as the constraint, the available bandwidth, or some sort of cost. Maybe if there is like a LTE backup, of course, if it's volume charged, then it's more expensive. Um, so there are a lot of different options to play around with. Um, the next uh, topic that we looked at was high availability, because I think especially at the hub side, high availability is really crucial for an enterprise to accept a solution for their production networks in case uh, you know at the hub at the central data center uh, one device fails there shall of course be some failover and it would not be acceptable to have a uh, service outage um, again we took the similar configuration from the previous test case in the uh, active active cpe cluster um, dual cpe mode from the nfx 250s and we now configured the hub sites in an active passive mode, um, the SRX 4100s, and uh, we generated traffic and then disconnected the primary hub power. So basically, we just switched off the uh, left, top left SRX 4100 power. We do this usually because we want to avoid that any, you know, if we would do this administratively, then maybe the two devices would have time to signal each other like some sort of graceful failover. We don't want to do this. We just cut the power and then um, basically the backup device and the whole scenario has to see how it can progress. Um, what happened was the, um, that, you know, the results will be shown uh, on, the, on the next slide. 
but uh, so once we had switched this off, we had measured the failover time, we had verified that everything uh, was running, then we reconnected the power after a while to, again to see if the traffic would revert back to the original primary hub, because even in an active passive scenario, maybe a service provider has a, or has a good idea why uh, one of the two should be the primary one and the other one should be the backup. Now let's look at the results. Um, the traffic did fail over and you can see in this graph in the bottom left of the slide, you can see that traffic was ramping up first and uh, there's both a, a green area and a blue line. The green area represents the HTTP throughput and the blue line represents the DNS queries we took. So we wanted to see H, um, yeah, TCP traffic as well as UDP traffic behavior. And um, so these, these dark green uh, things there are just, these stripes are just uh, unfortunately um, graphical you know, effects, but they have nothing to do with the traffic. So the traffic was always stable. And um, so what we saw is we failed over around second 500, as you can clearly see. Uh, there was a failover time for TCP of three seconds and for UDP of 18 seconds. And um, when we failed back around uh, 1,100 seconds towards the right side of the diagram, there was uh, no real out of service time. Uh, the, fail of the, the fallback happened in a sub-second scenario. And you can see that some of the DNS requests were you know, a little uh, affected, but uh, the, the fallback, the reverting to the original worked uh, very well. So another aspect um, that's quite interesting is customization. So initially, I think most service providers had hoped that SD-WAN would develop into a cheap one-size-fits-all service for tenants. So basically very fast provisioning, um, not as expensive as MPLS VPNs, um, simple to handle, and so on. But you know how it is in reality, uh, as soon as uh, one starts to sell anything in a B2B scenario, people will start asking for options and customization. And uh, Juniper has spent a lot of effort looking at how much customization can reasonably, reasonably be included in this whole scenario without having to go back to these kind of individual setups that uh, we know from the past, you know, where each big customer got their own individual uh, setup in the service provider data center, which was totally manually managed and very expensive to maintain. So uh, Juniper spent a lot of effort to create a template-based customization option. And I think it's a pretty advanced uh, technology. It uses open source. Uh, parts like uh, Jinja 2 for the configuration templates and um, you know the whole thing is pretty much open but I don't want to spend too much time with it um, just a few words on what we actually did um, we thought that one of the more simple configuration templates would be to enable DHCP relays on all of the CPEs so we could have of course lo just logged in to the CPEs and do it manually but that was not the goal here um, we said, let's create a custom template for the DHCP relay so that it can be enabled. Because it was DHCP relay is not a normal option that you can just click in CSO as part of the standard scenarios. Um, it's customer, needs to be customer defined. So the process is pretty straightforward. One starts with a configuration uh, designer, parameterizes, uh, the configuration, that was pretty simple. I mean, DHCP relay is listening to a certain um, network interface. And then uh, one defines these configuration templates uh, there with a resource designer. And uh, once the network service has been designed, like what kind of additional VNFs, if any, have to be added, then um, they get into a catalog, services catalog. And uh, at that time, both the administration uh, the administrator as well as the customer, if, if wanted, can access these, uh, this network services catalog. So it would even be possible, although we didn't test it, that the uh, tenant would be able to enable DHCP relay by themselves. So uh, we only ran uh, this kind of straightforward and simple DHCP relay template. It worked really well, uh, as expected. 
and uh, also the, the programming was very smooth. Of course, we had experts from Huawei available for our support, but it looked very straightforward. Um, Juniper says that uh, it should be possible to do way more advanced uh, templates, and I'm sure the service providers will play around this and will have some interesting uh, configurations in the future. Uh, the last topic that I want to highlight in this webinar is the monitoring and analytics. So on one hand, monitoring is like a byproduct of the application analysis. So for any traffic steering, as I said, applications need to be identified. And then once they are identified, it's pretty straightforward to also uh, gather the uh, throughput and the data statistics, uh, the performance of the application SLA, uh, was it maintained all the time, or uh, was there maybe some sort of network outage so that the SLA had to be violated for some time. Um, so the, the art here is really the graphical uh, display and also the database collection of all of this vast data. And uh, in the Juniper case, it's very nicely visualized from my point of view. You can see here like uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, some unnamed HTTP services, SMTP traffic were visualized in their uh, bandwidth they took in the kind of top talkers. A scenario so that this, the administrator can very quickly identify which are the main bandwidth hogs, and um, it was it was quite nice and um, in, intuitive to really play around with this application visibility module. Um, in the bottom, you can also see the round trip time. So we actually kept the monitoring running during our impairment test. So whenever we artificially increased the latency. We were able to quickly monitor the round trip time. As you can see here, it went up to 250 and beyond, 250 milliseconds and beyond over a time of like an hour. So um, that's also a good insight, uh, very, very straightforward monitoring as expected. So all in all, I think uh, from the summary, we were, we were impressed by the Contrail Services Orchestrator functionality, the scale, and also the very wide range of customization options. Um, we tested way more things. If you look here on this uh, list, I presented the first three of them. We also um, tested advanced unified threat uh, man, uh, monitoring security features, the threat management. So we saw uh, that uh, content filtering um, was possible. Of course, we didn't have the time to run a full-blown uh, firewall UTM test, but uh, we were able to see that uh, CSO actually does include these configurations and that the CPEs do implement them correctly. We also tested multiple different types of uh, non-SLA and application SLA-based uh, forwarding and um, policy-based routing. And um, so this kept us busy for two weeks because of the, the large number of different configuration options. And uh, the, the Juniper team was uh, really proud of the, the many things that can be tre tweaked and changed and adapted. And I think this is uh, really um, a, a software that is very customizable. So um, with that, I would like to ask you or in invite you to download the detailed uh, test report that we published. It's, uh, I think, eight or ten pages of detailed content. Um, the goal of our test report is always to describe the scenarios uh, detailed enough so that uh, you would be able to reproduce them in your own labs. So I invite you to rerun the same test or to check if the results are reproducible and um, contact me if you have any questions about the report. So with that, uh, back to you, Thierry. Thank you, Karsten. Um, we, we had a series of questions during the presentation, and uh, um, I'm afraid it's going to be uh, difficult to answer each and every of them. Uh, by the way, I also noticed that some of the questions asked during uh, the presentation were uh, indeed uh, answered during the, the presentation. Um, however, um, we have seen someone asking about the, uh, the uh, multi-vendor solution. Um, Karsten, I think this one belongs to you, and uh, if I can try to summarize it, um, I, would, uh, I would ask uh, 
uh, when can we expect a multi-vendor SD-1 interoperability and uh, what would it look like? Hmm. Yeah, so I think um, a lot of people in the industry, especially on the standards body side or industry forum side now are starting to um, talk or I would say dream of multi-vendor interoperability. So of course it's, it's um, something that uh, people would really want to have, especially as SD-WAN solutions grow over the coming years. And then eventually, of course, there will be uh, multiple SD-WAN vendors in one service provider network. Now, gen generically, I think there are two ways how interoperability can be achieved. The first one is to connect like alien CPEs. So let's say you have a, a full, fully set up SD-WAN solution from one vendor and you would like to add CPEs from a different vendor. I think in this case, the industry has to standardize some sort of standard fallback encoding, which will not be easy. But I think the Juniper solution with IPsec, um, GRE inside IPsec is already pretty standard and uh, straightforward to implement. And um, so that would be one way to achieve interoperability. And uh, the other way would be to achieve interoperability by connecting the orchestrators or the controllers. And uh, that requires much more standardization on the northbound side. The MEF is going into this direction, but I think it's a very long way until uh, protocols be, will be standardized sufficiently so that multi-vendor interoperability can be achieved. I think this topic will keep us busy for the next few years. <laughs> Indeed, yes, <laughs> very likely. Um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Karsten. Um, another, another question, maybe, uh, that I can see uh, is about what you mentioned on, on Brownfield scenario, Michael. Uh, can you elaborate more on the, the possibility to deal with the Brownfield uh, scenario? Sure, uh, sorry, thanks. So, uh, well, by Brownfield uh, scenario, uh, we mean that uh, most enterprises will uh, probably start from uh, an existing uh, one situation. So whether uh, if they go through a service provider, managed service, or through a do-it-yourself uh, mode of uh, operation. So um, here we want to really uh, propose a smooth migration, and there are several means that we can offer. Uh, the first one is that actually you can turn on SD-1 uh, just by software, uh, on your existing uh, SRX uh, branches CPEs, uh, which could be uh, somehow already deployed. And you can further uh, complement uh, them with uh, universal CPEs like uh, NFX, uh, for instance. And uh, second and uh, more important, uh, you can uh, migrate an existing uh, MPLS VPN service prog progressively to SD-1 uh, by growing uh, one or more uh, SD-1 islands and uh, interconnecting them through uh, standard BGP. Because again, we are using for routing, uh, you know, uh, well-known uh, standard BGP, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to route across uh, the overlay. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and finally, well, I already mentioned that, uh, but there are many already deployed products uh, that can uh, build uh, your uh, somehow SD-1, uh, you know, uh, cloud. And, and here, uh, well, you can rely on SRX, but also on MX uh, to play the role uh, of the hub or, or gateway. Uh, and finally, well, uh, uh, still related to Brownfield, uh, more on, from the OSS point of view, uh, because uh, Control Service Orchestration uh, does offer uh, open APIs, especially for the north, northbound interface. Uh, and also some open source uh, modules uh, like uh, Cassandra DB, RabbitMQ, Kubernetes, and others. Uh, it's really easy to, uh, to integrate uh, CSO within existing uh, OSS uh, backend environments. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Michael. Maybe we have time to uh, take uh, uh, one last. Uh, last question, and I'm, I'm sorry for those of you who ask uh, and uh, we cannot uh, answer online. Uh, maybe this one, eventually, Michael, um, if you're okay with that, say, uh, how integration, how to integrate the white box and other CPE, uh, from other uh, CPE suppliers? Sure. So, uh, well, I mentioned that briefly, uh, indeed. So, uh, uh, so today, uh, um, as available CPE uh, to play, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the SD-1 topology, 
Uh, we have, uh, as we said, uh, SRX branches, which, which are kind of regular, well-known, uh, you know, uh, all-in-one CPEs. Uh, we have also NFX, uh, which are, uh, you know, are universal CPEs, and there are several models, actually, of NFX uh, already available, like the NFX 250, the NFX 150 uh, as well. Uh, but what we want is to extend, uh, you know, the, the offering uh, to uh, software only. Uh, so that, that is something that we are working on and that will be available hopefully uh, very shortly. Uh, and that will consist of providing, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, what we call a soft NFX. So that will be a software package only that will be able to sit on, uh, you know, uh, uh, off the shelf, uh, you know, uh, x86, uh, you know, white box CPs that you could find on the market. So then the question comes from the integration, uh, of course. So here, uh, Juniper will pre-qualify, uh, you know, some models uh, because of the, of the, of the, of some major relationship that we may have with uh, uh, different service providers. Uh, but of course, uh, well, if uh, as an end customer, as, as a service provider, you want to extend that to a longer list, uh, well, uh, we could uh, work on a, on a customized, uh, you know, specific offer with you uh, to make uh, one or two more, uh, you know, CPs uh, eligible to uh, to interwork with our with our software. Because in the end, we we all know that you know uh, uh, there are, there are numbers of combinations possible uh, uh, with regards to a universal CP. Uh, between the number of cores uh, that you can uh, expect, the, the, the capacity of SSD that you may, uh, might need. So uh, the, um, that's why we are doing that, because we are pretty sure that there will be always a case where you will need uh, an additional product that is not uh, already uh, available. Okay, I, I can see um, uh, a series of, uh, of, a, of a question. Um, maybe, maybe we can take one or two quick uh, uh, ones. Uh, I think there was a question regarding the, the, uh, the capability to handle uh, uh, dual CP uh, in an active-active uh, manner. I think Karsten mentioned that already. Uh, but just to be clear, uh, we are leveraging, uh, you know, the clustering capability uh, that we were already having on SRX. Uh, we have extended that to the NFX uh, as well because, as, as Karsten pointed out, uh, VSRX is somehow running inside the NFX itself. So the NFX are, are working in a clustering uh, mode as well, so there is no difference actually between the two. And, uh, and the two equipments are, are seen as a single uh, device. Okay, so we, uh, I think we are getting to the, uh, to the end of this uh, session. Uh, Thank you very much, Michael, and also thank you very much, Karsten. Um, I think it's really now time to close this session. Please note, uh, you can still ask questions uh, using emails uh, displayed at the bottom of the screen, uh, either to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Juniper or to uh, the uh, ENTC uh, organization on the uh, info.entcd or abm at uh, juniper.net. Feel free to do that. Uh, that's, uh, that's what they are used for. Thank you very much again for your participation. Uh, I've been, I hope it's been very useful for you. And uh, we wish you all a very pleasant end of the day. And on behalf of uh, Juniper Networks and the uh, European Advanced Networking Test Center, thank you very much.